Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum, Oregon's premier public affairs forum. I'm Sharon Van Sickle Robbins, City Club President, and I would like to welcome you all, those of you here at the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB or KBPS radio, or watching on Portland Community Media's CityNet 30. Thank you for joining City Club today on Friday, June 25th for this week's Friday Forum. Today we will hear Governor Ted Kulingoski's recommendations for restructuring state government to overcome a decade of deficits. But first, some announcements. In consideration of those sitting close to you and those in our radio and television audiences, I ask everyone in the room to please silence your cell phones. If there are any members who have joined City Club recently or who are here with us at a Friday Forum for the first time, please stand and let us welcome you. As always, we offer our appreciation to those whose generous financial backing makes our time-honored City Club luncheons possible. Please join me in offering an appreciative round of applause to the Don Sterling City Club Fund of the Oregon Community Foundation. We greatly appreciate your support. If your company or firm would like to be a City Club sponsor, please contact City Club staff at the back of the room or call the City Club offices. In addition to Friday forums, City Club hosts many other events throughout the year, such as our Citizen Salon series. This dinner and discussion series brings together good food and great conversation, while at the same time supporting the vital mission of City Club. We invite you to join us for upcoming salons, whose topics include the future of the Republican Party, recognizing and building community, and Portland's virtual museum of cities. Election season is fast approaching, and for City Club's research arm, that means ballot measure studies. Study committees will be meeting in August and September, interviewing stakeholders, evaluating the claims made by supporters and opponents, and recommending how club members and the public at large should vote. If you'd like to volunteer to serve on one of the club's many ballot measure study committees, applications are available at the back of the room. In honor of Independence Day, we will not have a forum next week on July 2nd. Please join us on July 9th for live music by Boy Eats Drum Machine, followed by a panel of musicians discussing Portland's vibrant music scene. The panel will be moderated by Metro Council President and music enthusiast David Bragdon. And now to today's program. Today we will hear Governor Ted Kulingoski's recommendations for restructuring the state budget in order to overcome a decade of deficits created by the Great Recession. These recommendations come from the Governor's Reset Cabinet, which identified ways in which the state can continue to meet its responsibilities for education, health and human services, and public safety, despite reduced revenues, higher costs, and increased demand for safety net services. Ted Kulingoski is the only governor in Oregon history to have served in all three branches of state government. He spent his childhood in, a rur in rural Missouri and served a tour of duty as a Marine in Southeast Asia. The governor earned his law degree at the University of Missouri on the GI Bill. After moving to Oregon and opening his own law practice, he was elected to the Oregon House of Representatives and then to the State Senate. In 1992, he became Oregon's Attorney General and was later elected to the Oregon Supreme Court, where he served until 2001. Ted Kulingoski was first sworn in as governor in January 2003 and won re-election in 2006. And now, please help me welcome the governor of the state of Oregon, Ted Kulingoski. Thank you, Sharon, and I want to thank the uh, members of the City Club of Portland for your kind invitation to speak today. I also want to thank the members and friends of the City Club for joining me in a difficult but necessary conversation about Oregon's future. 
This is my eighth and final address as governor to the City Club of Portland. In April, I gave what was billed as my last State of the State speech. If that speech had been a television drama, it would have ended with a tagline, to be continued. I say that because today I want to finish what I spoke about in April. I said at that time that a collaboration of public and private citizens would make recommendations in June for restructuring state government. I called this the reset. June is here, and I have received the formal report of the reset cabinet, the first truly comprehensive attempt to deal with the structural problems of Oregon state government. The purpose of my remarks today is not to go through each recommendation. My purpose is to look forward and talk about our collective future, using some of the major themes in the report to make my point. I have many, many long-term friends in this room, and to be truthful, probably more than a few skeptics. But those who know me well know that I do not dwell on individual accomplishments, and I don't follow the path of least resistance. Instead, I try to do what is right and do what I believe is best for Oregon. Today, with six months left in my term, is no exception. I'm here to chart the road ahead, to shine a light, some will call it a harsh light, on the challenges we face and to do my best to answer some hard questions. I do not need to tell you what Oregon has been through the last 10 years. Two recessions in the space of a decade have left many of our fellow citizens economically bruised and battered. We weathered the first recession at the start of my term with some difficult years of budget cuts and high unemployment. But that was a traditional, even textbook, two-year recessionary cycle. Our economy went down and then came back up. And in Oregon's traditional way, we rebounded strongly, making up for lost time by rebuilding and reinvesting. We made new investments in energy and transportation, reached new peaks in funding for education, and expanded our health care system. And we started to follow the advice we give our children, save for a rainy day. We created a rainy day fund to help protect us from future downturns in the economy. But what hit us in 2008 was not a traditional recession. What we now call the Great Recession was the economic equivalent of a 10-point earthquake, knocking flat almost every measure of prosperity. Employment, housing, business expansion, retail sales, consumer confidence, pensions, and public investment, to name just a few. This was unlike anything that most of us have ever experienced. Not only did this recession undermine our economy and throw millions of productive Americans out of work, it left us, less, left us with less revenue to fulfill the core responsibilities of state government. And while economists using statistical models, not Oregon family budgets, tell us that the Great Recession is over, for many Oregonians, the pain, frustration, and heartbreak it caused remains. The fact is, the cost of this recession is still being tallied. And like the oil spill in the Gulf, we can only guess what the final bill will be. But this much we know. When the final bill comes due, the federal government won't be paying it. We will be on our own. The federal government has the luxury, and sometimes even the responsibility, to spend more than it takes in. But here in Oregon, we do not have that luxury. We must have a balanced budget. And there are no exceptions for deep recessions. The hard truth is this. No matter who is elected in November, or who is in control in Salem in 2011, Recovering from this Great Recession will be a long, slow, and difficult journey for Oregon. We may not be falling anymore, but it will likely be many years before we return to the robust growth we saw before this recession. In other words, 
next year will not be a repeat of 2007 when we could ride the wave of a rebound and make up for lost opportunities. Since a traditional economic rebound is not in the cards, Oregon will have to create the next decade's opportunities through hard work and tough choices. That means changing the way we think, our mindset, as well as changing the way government does business. Because the current structure of state government is simply not sustainable anymore. Last month, my reset cabinet delivered a candid analysis of Oregon's fiscal future. We will emerge from this recession with less revenue, higher cost, and greater demands for public services. That's the unvarnished challenge at our doorstep. And we can neither meet it now or spend the next decade stumbling from one deficit to the next. When the Reset Cabinet released their assessment last month, some called it bleak. No elected official wants to be handed a report that says, we're in uncharted territory and facing a budget shortfall of $10 billion over the next 10 years. I half joked that these predictions, like grief, have sent us through the stages of shock and denial, anger and blame. But this process also leads to opportunity and resolve. You might ask, how can I be optimistic when I just had to cut more than a half a billion dollars in services, when more than 10 percent of Oregonians are out of work, and when a decade of a billion dollar deficits looms on the horizon? Because joblessness and a decade of deficits is our fate only, only if we choose to make it so. There are solutions to our budget problems if we are willing to think differently and make hard choices. We can turn the decade of deficits and joblessness into a decade of stability and prosperity. We can create a new path for Oregon's future. But we must work collectively if we are going to reposition Oregon for long-term stability and success. Keep in mind that this is not just the effectiveness of state government that's at stake. The very foundation of our economy is at stake. Our ability to keep people safe in their homes and in their communities is at stake. The quality of our children's education from early childhood through high school and beyond is at stake. So we can choose the vision to change and the will to protect Oregon's fundamental values or blind adherence to the status quo. If we do not rise to the occasion and get this right, we will lose far more than government services. We will lose our quality of life, our civic house, our economic competitiveness, our ability to protect Oregon's natural treasures, and many of our best and brightest students. So the case I make today is about nothing less than who we are as a people, what we want for our future, and why the time to act is now. The bottom line purpose of the resort re resort set report is to rethink the problems that confront state government, families, and our economy and reposition Oregon for a stable, predictable, and thriving future. This is a major challenge, and these changes are not without controversy. But we must not let these recommendations turn into political ammunition from one, one side or the other. The task of repositioning Oregon for long-term success is too important to be sacrificed on the battlefield of partisan political warfare. I know and I understand that's acting, asking a lot. And the temptation will be to simply rerun the tired political debate of whether we have a revenue problem or a spending problem. This is not and cannot be just a conversation about more taxes or about a new tax structure to create more taxes. It must be about 
the proper functions of government and how we spend our tax dollars. With this report, we have taken stock of the role and functions of state government and concluded that the government we have is too expensive to maintain in the wake of the Great Recession, and just as important, too prone to failure when the next recession arrives. The report analyzes where we are today and makes recommendations for how we can provide better, smarter, more efficient, and more certain government services. We need that certainty to prevent the up and down fund and cut practices that have become endemic to Oregon's government. As I said, I'm not going to recite every recommendation, but in addition to copies I have made available today, you can find the report on my website at governor.oregon.gov. I encourage you to read the full report. I also welcome additional recommendations and ideas. That's why the website will have a future feature where you can add your own thoughts and recommendations. The report has a lot of very useful information, and I guarantee you there is something for each of us to like, dislike, and want to add. I realize that the recommendations in this report will invite criticism and scrutiny. I welcome both, but reject any impulse to defend turf, point fingers, or reject change. The Reset Report challenges us to find workable solutions that put Oregon on a more secure and stable fiscal path for the future. Each and every one of us must accept that challenge. Since I know this report will provoke debate, I want to tell you I want the debate to begin at this podium. I want to talk about a proposal that is certain to attract the attention of headline writers, crime and public safety. Crime in Oregon and across the nation has reached historic lows, both personal crime and property crime. We owe law enforcement, prosecutors, judges, community corrections, rehabilitation and treatment programs much of the credit for this dramatic turnaround. And yes, we must also acknowledge the role of changing demographics and that some some of the reduction is due to increased enforcement and incarceration, but not all. Incarceration is the most expensive tool in the public safety toolbox. Every state across this country is being forced to review and reconsider, ex and reconsider expensive mandatory sentencing strategies in light of the Great Recession. Oregon must do the same. There are strategies, without jeopardizing public safety, that will lower the cost of incarceration through diversion programs that send people to training and local supervision and are kept out of our prison system. Public safety interest groups will argue that Oregon's falling crime rate is due solely to mandatory sentencing. But other states have reduced their crime rates at less cost using different sentencing programs. So this is a debate we as a people must have. But there is no debating that if we change nothing, Oregon's prison population will continue to increase substantially over the next 10 years. Consider this. Changes in sentencing policy since the mid-1990s, including the adoption of Measure 11, have doubled our prison population from 7,000 to more than 14,000 inmates. This has led to a 250% increase in the Department of Corrections budget, a number that is expected to grow at an unsustainable rate if we continue the policies in place today. Now let me ask you this. Have we more than doubled our investment in students over the same time period? And I would tell you, it's not even close. So we have a real dichotomy, which I would summarize as locking up more people versus providing our children with a better education. This, and there is a great imbalance between how we invest in incarceration and how we invest in education. 
And right now, children are trapped on the losing end of that imbalance. It's not right, it's not fair, and most of all, it's not smart. At a time of declining crime rates and at a time we can least afford our current mandatory sentencing policies, let alone voting for more of the same in this November election, do we really want to continue on this path of a blank check for corrections and a message of check back with me in 10 years for adequate school programs and funding? The time is now to find more effective and sustainable ways to use the hundreds of millions of dollars we spend on incarceration. This does not mean that we stop holding criminals accountable or shorten sentences for violent offenders. I will not tolerate that, and I know that the people of this state will not tolerate that. But there are sanctions we can take to reduce some sentences for some offenders without sacrificing public safety and ways to divert offenders from prison, such as increased commitment to drug and alcohol treatment programs. These options must be explored. This will take political courage and will on the part of Oregon lawmakers to act and help Oregonians understand that being smart on crime and smarter about how we spend our limited dollars does not mean that we are being soft on crime. Another issue the report takes on is education, an issue that is critical to Oregon's economic future. Here are a few questions we need to answer. Can we provide all of our students with a better education with the billions of dollars we currently invest each year? Can we be more efficient? Can we improve student performance while investing our dollars more strategically? All the data and the studies that address these questions tell us the answer is yes. Right now, the recurring debate in Oregon around K through 12 is about money. Every legislative session and with each governor's recommended budget, our commitment to K-12 is measured by a number. That is what is debated and negotiated. Where is the debate about accountability? Do you hear us debating student performance, standards and curriculum, teacher performance and evaluations, consolidation of services, and more efficient data systems? The answer is no. On these questions, the silence is deafening. The big debate is always about the number, meaning the budget number. But rarely, rarely does the discussion turn to the number of students who succeed much less how prepared they are to compete in this demanding economy. We must end the practice of evaluating the success of our educational system based solely on how much money it receives. We must stop claiming political victories based on a budget number. Money is not an outcome. It is a means to achieve that outcome. So let's turn our attention to outcomes and what we're actually buying with our K through 12 dollars. This is not about accounting, it's about accountability. Regardless of the number, the state has to start holding our schools accountable for the money we give them. The first step is to align funding with student outcomes. We must align teacher evaluations with student performances. And that is just the beginning. We should use emerging te technology to improve education options for students through online learning and virtual classrooms. We must embrace charter schools and make them part of the education system. And if a school is failing, we must take the hard but necessary steps to turn that school around or close it down. We must redesign the current education service district structure and create a new streamlined and more cost-effective regional system to manage school district payrolls, accounting, technology, and transportation needs at a minimum. The current structure is redundant, inefficient, outdated, and simply put, a waste of resources. There is a smarter way. Finally, 
if we are serious about accountability for our schools, we should return to the framework of our original state constitution and make the superintendent of public instruction a position appointed by the governor. Right now, our approach to education governance and accountability is fragmented and something, to be very frank with you, of a Rube Goldberg contra contraption. The school board is appointed by the governor. The State Department of Education is run by a separately elected public official. And the legislature sets funding for 197 individual school districts that each has its own local governing board, hires its own chief executive officer, and has the right to contract and bind the state to pay for those contracts. Simply put, the lines of governance and accountability in our K-12 system are broken. When the U.S. Secretary of Education wanted to know why Oregon would not be reapplying for a Race to the Top grant, I had to tell him that despite our best efforts over the last year, we were not ready. We still have more work to do. No function of government is more important to our economic future than education. The last eight years has only strengthened my belief that responsibility for education should rest with the governor. I just talked about K through 12, but our post-secondary system is also in need of retooling with new lines of accountability for the money the state invests. Here too, failure or success cannot be based on a budget number. Instead, we need to ask new and different questions. Why are more students taking five, six, and seven years to complete a four-year degree at an added cost for them and for taxpayers? Are we making post-secondary education affordable to all qualified students, or has it become a system based more on one's ability to pay than one's determination to learn? Is our current governance structure for post-secondary education both accountable to taxpayers and flexible enough to deliver a quality education. My recept cabinet recommends the creation of a compact between the state and the university system. The compact would allow each of our seven public universities to move forward with clear goals and performance targets tied to their funding. This approach is long overdue. But I want to give credit to our universities. They are more entrepreneurial and doing more with less because of the funding constraints imposed by our current structure. But now is the time to formalize these realities in a new relationship that balances accountability and flexibility and gives proper attention to the unique mission of each university and the demographics of the populations they serve. The report recommends that we build on our shared responsibility model for student financial aid bringing more need-based aid into the system from our public universities, community colleges, and the private colleges and universities that participate in the Oregon Opportunity Grant Program. This approach offers a new way to expand resources from private donors as we stretch to accommodate the surge of high school graduates seeking to further their education. The Oregon Opportunity Grant Program promises that with reasonable contributions from students and their families, we will do our part to make a college education affordable for every Oregonian with the desire and the, the ability to pursue it. This is a promise we must deliver. Our focus on higher education must also recognize the critical role universities play in research and innovation, which is to, in today's economy, are engines of growth and prosperity. No matter how tight our state budget, we must make room in our investment decisions for university-based research and development. Oregon's economic future, including our ability to compete nationally and internationally, depends on it. I want to talk for just a moment about Oregon Health and Sciences University. OHSU is critical to our economy and our ability to provide high-quality health care for all of our citizens. 
OHSU must have greater access to capital markets to support its public missions of education, research, and caring for some of our most vulnerable citizens. The legislature must give OHSU the right to access those markets. This is maybe one of the most difficult parts of the reset for me. And I'm just going to rip the Band-Aid off of this once and say it. Increasing labor cost will be a big contributor to future deficits if we do not change the way we budget and provide compensation for public employees. I stand second to no one in my belief in the importance of public employees and the value of the work they do. I know it's popular to blame public employees for every problem facing government. That is not true, and it is not fair. Public employees are not to blame for our deficits. The problem is not what has happened in the past, but what lies ahead with rising costs for retirement and health benefits and not enough money to pay for them. The cost to the state for the public employee retirement system, PERS, will increase by more than $350 million in the next biennium and by almost $1 billion more by 2017. The cost of health care benefits are another concern. With the cost of health care increasing more than 10 percent a year, I think it is fair to ask state employees and school employees to share the burden of bringing these costs under control. Add health care costs to retirement costs and we will soon be looking at benefit increases for public employees that far exceed the increases in pay and benefits projected for their private sector counterparts. So my message to state and school employees is this. If you don't want a decade of deficits to turn into a decade of layoffs and wage freezes, work with us to manage the cost of your benefits and keep your pay in line with your counterparts in the private sector. The fact is, we approach budgeting for labor costs in state government completely backwards. Instead of identifying the total cost of compensation, we budget separate amounts for cost of living pay increases, seniority step increases, health care benefits, and retirement benefits. This fragmented approach must end. We need to approach labor cost as a part of a total compensation budget. Furthermore, we need to look at a system that is equitable for both state and school employees. The state contributes twice as much of its general fund budget to cover the pay and benefits of school employees as it does to cover the pay and benefits of its own workforce. We need to make the labor cost of school employees as transparent to policymakers and fair to taxpayers as the labor costs of state employees. For this reason, I believe the time has come to move to a system of statewide collective bargaining for teachers and school employees like other states do. Doing so will promote equity across school districts, reduce administrative costs, and enable districts to redirect funds now spent on extended labor negotiations into the classroom. <clears throat> but whatever bargaining system is in place, we need to confront the rising cost of benefits in the next biennium. As I said, budget projections show that the growing cost of PERS and health care benefits alone will drive our labor cost well above increases projected for private sector workers in 2011, even, even if we continue the current wage freeze for state employees. Let me talk to you about how we can address the rising cost of retirement and health benefits. With respect to PERS retirement, we must end the practice of state and local governments picking up the employee's 6% PERS contribution. Some school districts have already ended this benefit for their employees. The time has come for the state and remaining school districts to do the same. Health care is another big factor in the escalating cost of our public workforce. The state offers a comprehensive health care benefit. This is as it should be. 
but the time has come for employees to contribute to the cost of their health care benefits. The Reset Cabinet offers a list of options for accomplishing cost sharing. Which of these options is best should be discussed and negotiated. But there is no escaping this reality. The state can no longer afford to pick up the entire tab for health, dental, and vision benefits when their costs are going up 10 percent a year. The time has come for the state to manage employee compensation the way the private sector does. This is the right thing for the state and for Oregon taxpayers. Lastly, my Reset Cabinet recommends that we build a strong reserve fund. This is the single most important step we can take to maintain fiscal stability and provide the core governmental services Oregonians depend on. If you think a reserve fund is a luxury and not a necessity, consider this. We could cut the cost of government by 20 percent and still face a budget hole when the next recession hits if we don't start saving. I won't spend a lot of time on this top topic because you've heard me talk and pound my fist about it for the last two years. We must reform the kicker by creating a constitutionally protected emergency reserve fund that ends our roller coaster budgeting. We must stop the self-defeating policy of increasing taxes or slashing services as the answer to every economic downturn. We do not have to have a repeat of the fight over measures 66 and 67. We don't have to keep making the kind of cuts that I just had to make in this biennium's budget. We don't have to settle for getting by in difficult times when we could be moving ahead at all times. But to achieve this vision, we must find the political courage and will to do what is right and give the citizens a better way to use kicker revenues. In April, I told you that the reset was coming. Today, I told you what is in the reset report. Now I want to spend a moment to tell you what I intend to do with this report. First of all, I'm going to spend much of the next six months traveling across Oregon, talking to citizens about this report and sparking a vigorous debate about what it says, the consequences of doing nothing, and the most promising road to collective prosperity. I'm also going to use the reset report to frame my budget recommendations for the 2011-13 legislative session. Some reports end up sitting on a shelf. This one will be sitting on the desk of our legislators and will set the stage for our economic and fiscal future. Let me close my remarks with some personal thoughts. When you get hit by an economic storm, you can learn from the experience and prepare for the next one, or assume the sky will clear on its own and return to business as usual. The lessons of the last two years is this. Some storms linger long after the rain and wind stop. The Great Recession did not hit us and move on. It hit us and left us a changed reality. Working families, vulnerable citizens, educational institutions, and our economy have suffered real damage. And we now know that our traditional playbook is outdated and ill-equipped to repair that damage. We must rebuild state government using a playbook that will weather future storms, serve us in good times and bad, and last for generations. When I say we, I do not mean we in government. I mean, we as Oregonians, these choices are ours to make. I know that there will be strident opposition from the interest groups that arrive in Salem this coming January, and that, doing, and that during a campaign year, some of the recommendations I spoke to you about today will make candidates want to duck for cover. But we don't have that luxury anymore, and frankly, Oregonians deserve better than a campaign of sound bites that deliver only empty promises and easy answers. The issues confronting our state are too serious and too important to our collective future to let those seeking to represent us in Salem 
dodge their responsibility to engage Oregonians during this election cycle in this critical debate. If they don't like what the Reset Cabinet has put on the table, the public deserves to hear their solutions. I also know that those threatened by some of these changes may dismiss the report in my speech today because I am nearing the end of my term. It would be easy for me to leave the stage quietly and hand the next governor this problem without offering any solutions. That would be unfair to the citizens of Oregon, the people I have been proud to represent for the last 40 years in public office. As I said, I do not take the path of least resistance. So let me start this debate and let me open this dialogue. Let us look at all of the options in this report, not as the last word on how to reposition Oregon for success, but as a work in progress and an invitation to other ideas. Change is hard, but uncertainty is worse. We can turn a decade of deficits into a stable and prosperous future for Oregon. It just takes courage and the will to believe that Oregon and our future are worth it. I believe. Let's join together to make a better Oregon. Thank you, and God bless Oregon. Thank you. The, the first question for our speaker, as always, will be from our Friday Forum host, and our host today is Pat McCormick. For 20 years, Pat was a partner at Conkling, Fiskum and McCormick, a public affairs research and public relations firm. Now Pat is a partner in AMPM PR, a Portland public relations firm he recently founded with his daughter Allison. Pat has been a City Club member since 1969 and is a new member of the club's Board of Governors. Pat? Thank you, Jared. Thank you Governor Kulangoski, for really challenging remarks that I think as Oregonians and as City Club members give us a lot to think about and to work on. Uh, as Sharon noted in her introduction of you, you have a remarkable career in public service that spans as much time as I can remember in public service myself. Since 1974, when you were first elected, you've witnessed how the volatile ups and downs of Oregon's economy have impacted and inflicted damage on state budgets and school budgets as well. As you noted, recessions bookended your term as governor. State government now faces massive budget cuts, and another experienced Oregonian politician, uh, John Kitzhaber, is quoted as saying, we're witnessing a massive failure of governance. He said, in the two to four years away from now, the kind of financial and political meltdown Oregon faces is the same as other states such as California are experiencing. Governor, this disaster didn't sneak up on us. In some of your earliest speeches as governor, including here at the City Club, you yourself described the fundamental problems that have led us to this day. Today you laid out challenges that lawmakers elected in November will have to face what is it about our state government and our politics and our history in Oregon that keeps us from making progress on these solving these seemingly intractable problems and what makes you optimistic we'll be able to do it now? You know, I wish there was just one simple answer, uh, thing I could point to, but it's a, an accumulation of things over the years. And, and, you know, I can start with the economic side of this. And I think what is so different right now, if you look at the last four recessions in this state uh, between in the early 80s, 90s, 01, 02, and this one, you'll notice until this one, there was a process that just became part of our system of governance. And that is a recession would come, as I said in my remarks, we'd go down, but we always came back. And we always have come back very strongly I mean, we actually tried and came above where we were when we started. And the problem is, this time, 
is we're not going to rise to that level again where we were before this recession started. And I wish I could tell you that we will get there in another year, but I don't think we're going to get there for a number of years. And so I think, first of all, economically, what I said in here in my remarks about the, this recession, I think this was life-changing, not just in economic terms, but a new reality of how government functions. Secondly, I think what we're, is happening to us is that we're having a, an accumulation of events around the initiative process that are all coming home to roost. I have to tell you that you, all you have to do is to look to California and see what happens if you do not get control of this. And I, I think that ultimately that what we're going to have to do is having the initiative process, and this is an argument saying never have the initiative process, we have to approach it differently to engage the citizens in a type of governance that actually these measures actually improve their quality of lives, not score political points for one group or another. And so I think that uh, uh, if you look at the economy, you look at the, uh, 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 the initiative process, and to be very frank with you, we all got used to this was just the way we governed. So I said in my remarks, this endemic process that we have, going down, coming back up, we're just not coming back up for some time, I believe. Now, the other thing, can I tell you, I believe, I, this is my thing, I, I'm an optimist at heart. I believe in the goodness of people. I believe that we collectively and our elected officials want to do what is right for the state. And what I laid out both in the earlier report and in this report on the reset tells them why they have to take that challenge and move forward at this time. This is about our collective futures. We're now going to take questions from the floor. Asking questions at Friday forums is a privilege of City Club membership. So before asking your question, please identify yourself as a City Club member and ask your question in 30 seconds or less. If I flash this question mark card, it means please wrap up with your question. Thank you. Chris Allman, City Club member. Thank you for your courage in pushing for a kicker reform. Uh, my question in regards to that, especially uh, because of all the negative letters regarding Measure uh, 66 and 67 that suggests that our lack of progress is attributable to that, I have a couple questions. Um, a, are you going to um, ask the legislature to meet in a special session to try to get kicker reform, especially since there's many rumors that the kicker will kick? And B, will you do what you can to maintain our relatively progressive tax structure and not and encourage that we don't allow a decrease in capital gains taxes? Thank you. Let me uh, address the first about a special session. Um, I have an immediate problem I'm trying to deal with the legislature right now, and that is over a $577 million deficit. And, uh, we're still talking about that. Uh, I think the realities of what we're going to do are coming into focus more clearly because I think there was a great deal of anticipation two or three weeks ago that Congress was going to put through another stimulus that would bail us out of this, and it is looking less likely that that is going to happen every day. So uh, I uh, am not interested in having a special session for just re uh, reforming the kicker. Uh, but what I am interested in is talking to them about how, if they have some suggestions on how to uh, relook at the budget cuts and uh, what we could do about that. On, on the issue of uh, the tax system, you know, I put together, and, and the chairman of, the, of that uh, commission is sitting down here today in front of me, and it's the uh, Tax Restructuring Committee, and I would urge you all to look at it. Do you know what that report said? It did, it has, a, it has graphs and it has a section because it gave a revenue forecast for Oregon for the next decade. Do you know what the forecast was when they put out the report in 20, in uh, 08, 07? It said that we were going to have 10 years of continued revenue growth with surpluses. So, 
I want, that isn't against the report. What I want you to do is to understand this, what I talked about today, I do not want to just move into a debate about taxes or no taxes or this tax structure or that tax. This is about governance. It's about doing with what we have and how we're going to do that. So I uh, actually uh, have uh, probably the only Democrat in the building that actually thinks that there should be an adjustment of the capital gains tax, but uh, it's probably why it's never happened. I was the only one. <laughs> oh, Pat says he agreed with me. Go ahead. Um, Governor Kulingowski, my name is Angela Wyckoff, and I'm a City Club member. First of all, I'd like to thank you for addressing some issues which are so important to the state, and um, these issues, I think, would be important whether or not we're in a recession. Um, there are structural changes that need to be made, and thank you for addressing them. Um, my question is regarding the article in the Oregonian this morning, which uh, makes it look as though our federal funding is at risk because we haven't financed education to the 2006 level. And so my question to you is, are we going to be able to fund, and it's mainly higher education and special education, if I remember correctly. My question to you is, are we going to be able to fund um, higher education and special education to those levels? And if not, how will that play out? You, you've. Uh identified it fairly well. It's not an issue with K-12. It's an issue with the higher ed and a specific program within the higher ed community college post-secondary system. Let me tell you that uh, we were well aware of this, uh, the Senate President and the Speaker and all the revenue people. If I tell you what the problem is, we solved the maintenance of effort with $5 bills. The federal government says we won't take $5 bills, we only take $1 bills. And we've asked them to let us pay for the maintenance of effort with our $5, which I believe that they will do. And I think other states are doing the same thing. I know it was a good story, but it was something that we knew about and we planned on, and I believe that there is an answer to it and we will be successful with it. And by the way, with the $5 and $1, they said that I have to maintain the maintenance of efforts with general fund dollars. We have the university system and the presidents are here that are using tuition dollars to meet that maintenance of effort. For whatever reasons, the federal government on a technical basis said, well, even those, those are public dollars, they're not general fund dollars, and we can't use them for them counting the maintenance of efforts. I believe that they will come our way on this argument. Mac Pritchard, uh, City Club member. Thanks for your remarks, Governor. I, uh, particularly raising the issue of health care costs, and you talked about uh, your proposal to shift uh, part of those costs to employees. But I'd like to hear your thoughts as well about what the state can do to control costs so that double-digit increases in health care just aren't part of the normal way that we do business. What do you think you could do in the next six months, and what would you recommend to the legislature and your successor? You know, let me rephrase something you said in the beginning, because you always make it look like a, sound like it's a negative to ask people to sh share part of the burden of picking up the cost. I just think it's fair. I'm not doing anything that's onerous or anything else. It's just saying you should have an interest in holding health care costs down. If I pay them all for you, you don't have much of an incentive. That's first. So I think what I'm asking is just fair. Second. Actually, the PEB board probably does as well as any group in the state in holding down health care costs. What I'm asking is that if you take an interest and you've got a financial stake in it yourself, you are going to look at the programs that the reset uh, cabinet suggested be on the table, things like non-smoking, obesity, all these things, I think you'll pay a greater interest in it. Let me suggest that in the end, the state always wants to be a good employer, as every employer does. I truly believe that. But I also think you have to have policies in place that motivate people to have a self-interest 
in trying to keep the cost down themselves. And I think that's what this is all about. As much as it is about is reducing the cost to government, it is also about taking personal responsibility. Uh, Jim Zarin, City Club member. Uh, Governor, you mentioned in your remarks the difficult issues that are challenging the state and something about the kinds of questions uh, we voters ought to be looking to our uh, candidates to address. And I'm wondering if you could maybe just talk a little bit more about that. We all know that you're from a particular party, but we've got uh, two candidates running for governor and lots of people running for the legislature. Given your lifelong experience with all this, what kinds of things should Oregonians ask themselves about what they're hearing and seeing from the candidates for state office? You know, let me suggest that to you, this isn't just a debate for the candidates for state office. I think you should ask the candidates for the legislature to ask the same questions you would ask the two gubernatorial or three gubernatorial candidates, how many there are. I think everybody wanting to go to Salem should be addressing the issues that have been raised in the reset report. It's around education. It's about outcomes. We put a lot of money into education. I know we say we don't because there's always a statement we want more. But you can't just value what we're doing with education by just a budget number. Ultimately, you have to look at the success of the students. And what the Reset Cabinet is suggesting is that be an outcome tied to the funding issue. So when I look at this, the big picture and I talk to uh, the candidates, I want them to talk about outcomes, about improving our educational system, our K through 12 system. How do you do it? If you don't like what I'm doing and I'm suggesting to you, tell me what you think we should do. But don't tell me, just give me more money. It's not an answer now. And I think that if you actually engage the legislators and legislative candidates and the gubernatorial candidates in this debate, which I set forward today, I actually think a number of the changes will come about that I suggested when they come in in January. I think it will be part of their legislative agendas because they will run on it. You have to hold the legislators accountable, as I'm just saying, we have to hold the educational systems accountable for the money we give them. Uh, Kurt Wavering, member. Um, the Oregonian reported a few days ago that you were asking for a 10 percent across the board uh, cut in the budget. You're also saying that we have to make hard choices. Um, managers who make hard choices make choices between programs and between expenditures. And you're talking about across the board. Could you uh, clarify that for me? Well, let me tell you what the law says, <laughs> and I'll clarify it. The law says I have to go across the board. The legislature passed a law that said I have to go across the board. You want to know why? I wish John were here. Because when John had the five special sessions, he did what you suggest, which I wish I could do now, that I could make choices. And the legislature got upset about it at him because they thought that what he was doing was cutting their programs and keeping the things that he liked. And so they passed a law that says, you can't do that. You have to go across the board. I have no choice in the matter. Now, I'm going to be very frank with you. I actually had my legal counsel look at it, and I wanted to challenge it because I think it's a constriction on the executive's authority to administer the government. They shouldn't be allowed to do that. But given the crisis I'm in, and at the time frame I'm in, I have to do this in as quick a time period as I can. Because you do understand that as each month goes by, that number, 10 percent, gets higher as I take it against the base budgets. And so I have to move quickly on it, and I exercise the allotment authority which I have under the statute. But the simple answer is, that's what the law says. I wish it didn't. We, 
We've obviously run out of time for further questions, and we'll have to stop for this week. Again, we have no forum next week to honor Independence Day, but please join us on July 9th for a discussion about the economic and acoustic impact of Portland's independent music scene. And as we close, please join me in expressing again our appreciation to today's guest, Governor Ted Kulangoski. We're adjourned.